Okay. So, how are we doing? Just go. I should go down go. like this. No, no, no. Higher. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure. Nobody. Uh, just wait a minute. Yeah. Should I do this? Put this here? This works yeah, pretty so. well, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's what I will do. Oh, uh, oh I have to get... Hi, Jessica. 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 Hi, Jessica.
Okay, so once again, hello everyone, here we are. And I apologize to those who, who read um, my introduction just, I guess it would be last night, uh, in, in New York at least, when I mentioned that today will be the 19th of November. Even when I was writing it down, I was thinking, well, 13th to 19th can't be seven days, but uh, I think that was uh, just a little blip of uh, wishful thinking on my part, and actually a little bit interesting, considering... Uh, part of today's uh, subject matter, I would, I would say, uh, because what that pointed to is somehow as you get uh, used to something, you become a little bit sloppy. I mean, not you, but we do. Everybody, I do, become sloppy. Don't you start not to quite pay attention to things. And uh, that's why mistakes, like my little mistake of the date, uh, happen. Uh, when I will be talking about practicing, I, uh, I think this becomes really apropos of others. Are we uh, st still... Uh, okay. I promised in my... Uh, introduction not to speak too much about politics and thing, but I, I have to do a little bit because things are just too crazy. Uh, of course, as uh, this morning, the world registered over 57 million cases of COVID-19 and the U U.S., what's happening? <laughs> I do. We we need to have a, a, a live stream outtakes. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be very very amusing, much more amusing than my live streams. <laughs> In any case, uh, so the U.S. is registering almost or just approaching and probably will actually go above this approaching 200,000 cases every day of this and so far I, I write right here it's this morning's uh, kind of uh, register uh, 258,363 deaths in the US so far more than 1,500 a day at the moment. Uh, and yet, we still have an administration which is casting doubt on, on the election and uh, refusing to share information with the incoming um, administration. It's really remarkable. I, I, f a few things here which are... are Quite something I just uh, read in the paper today. Now, so you have Trump's lawyers. This is Rudy Giuliani, who's who's quite crazy, and uh, Sidney Powell. I know, I know, I know. I, but this is uh, we have to go beyond cancellation. They alleged that there's widespread fraud in the election because of massive, as here, this is what, what was written, massive influence of communist money through Venezuela, Cuba, and likely China, which interfered with the elections in the, in the United States. Uh, at least, even the conservative media said that this is truly bonkers and they said that's really unbelievable uh, I think that a, a good bit of what the, the obstruction that uh, Trump and his, his administration uh, 
is involved with is prompted by the fact that in New York, for instance, there are very serious indictments against him, against his organization, against his companies, and uh, uh, including things like uh, tax write-offs for $26 million in consulting fees, which seemed rather uh, fraudulent, and many other things. Also, uh, as it turns out, of course, a decent proportion of the money which people are donating for uh, to cover the cost of these voter fraud lawsuits that are going on now. There have been 31, I believe, which have been actually uh, dismissed by the courts so far. That, but a significant proportion of the money that's supposedly going there is actually being diverted to the uh, Trump election campaign and to the Republican National Committee po political organizations, which actually have nothing to do with what the uh, money is supposedly earmarked for. Uh, okay. I think it's enough of that. Great. But we still have, have more to do before uh, talking about music. And uh, everything is in any way connected, in, in a way. And I want to introduce a fascinating book, very, I think, rather important book, which I've been uh, reading now. It's called Evil Geniuses by Kurt Anderson. And let me actually show you a cover of that book. Let's see if we can see that. Okay. You have it? And this book, uh, sorry, let me let me go back to what I want to, to say. Really uh, outlines the basic takeover of both political dialogue and actual political fundraising and uh, cultural discussion by a very small group of very conservative, uh, I would say reactionary and uh, very wealthy people. Um, now in few things. I mean, there's a lot that I, I hear. Uh, yeah, okay. And I wanted to, to speak about global warming, which is called climate change, and is, of course, the most uh, dire and pressing problem in the world today, even though we are in the midst of a pandemic. The pandemic will end, of course, but the issue of global warming uh, could end in incredible disaster for everybody. And this is, to me, quite uh, fascinating because uh, as I've been reading more and more, and this, this book actually does uh, have very uh, nice excerpts about this, uh, you see how a combination of, what should I say, uh, noble lies, which turned into ignoble lies, as we say, and simple greed have been able to warp a discussion uh, 
to the extent that uh, something which we should have as a planet and as a, a species, as human species, that we should have actually dealt with by this time in a very systematic and thorough way is completely uh, neglected. Okay, now, first of all, what uh, I didn't re under uh, consider, actually, and, uh, had, and that has to do with the actual phrases global warming and climate change. Somehow, I thought that climate change was adopted and adopted by perhaps the, uh, the we can call it the liberal side, or what, if you want, because uh, global warming could be so easily uh, uh, dismissed in a certain sense because, for instance, uh, uh, in New York City, yesterday it was quite cold. And the difference between what is climate and weather uh, is something that is, is not so evident, perhaps, and on a daily basis for uh, people. Or, okay, but as it turns out, and here, I want to see this. This is, uh, one second here. Sorry, I'm, I have all this. Sorry, I'm I'm uh, uh, not not this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> See, I'm. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm organized now. That the term climate change was actually coined by the uh, conservative uh, pollster, kind of uh, media influencer, whose name is Frank Luntz. And this was in 2002, where he, he wrote that so far their decade of climate change denial propaganda has been effective, but they need to redouble it. It says, voters believe there is no consensus about global warming within the scientific community, should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. Therefore, you need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue, he wrote, and continue to challenge the science. Hmm. And Luntz recommended to use the term climate change rather than global warming because global warming has catastrophic communications attached to it, where climate change sounds more controllable and less emotionally challenging. 
this is a uh, uh, it's so uh, interesting here we go let me go back here sorry I, I should have better uh, control over my notes but I don't uh, yeah okay now this is also page 484-486. Then, but if we go back in time, I know, I know, I know. I, I'm really in bad shape today because I, I, I put all this information together and it's all, I, but I wasn't able to actually uh, do this in any kind of a, a correct way. No, something is not right in this. So I have to go back. And anyway, okay. Uh, but it it was. Let me see what I do here. No, I don't need that. Uh, see, I have all this. Should not be. This is. Yeah. Uh, I'm so sorry that uh, I'm I'm uh, I have this, but I can't connect to the pages in the book to read from after this. Uh, okay, but the point that I'm trying to make, and this I, I this is fine, is that already in 1980 the specter of uh, global warming was really before the country, before uh, industry, and actually had uh, companies such as Exxon doing uh, research and also had the agreement of the people in industry, let's say. I don't know why I'm, I'm so sorry uh, that this is greenhouse effect. Let me try this hard side because I want to get this to be a little better. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. This is what I wanted to say. There, finally. Thank you. Okay. Uh, even during the Reagan administration, Reagan's environmental czar, you could say, said that there can be no more important or conservative concern than the protection of the globe itself and that the United States should continue burning oil and gas and coal only as necessary. You see, so everything was beginning uh, even in the early 1980s to actually uh, develop a program to cope with global warming. This and I will say global warming because that's actually what is what is happening. 
but what happened was that the dialogue was hijacked by just a small group of people, including Frank Luntz, for instance, and we are left in the situation that we are in today. Um, okay, I know, I know, I know. I, it's I'm, I'm getting terrible uh, things because I'm I'm not in uh, really. I, Okay, I think enough of this, perhaps, that right now, and uh, I, I will deal with this in a more organized way at some point in the future. Uh, it's just the, the way things played, played out involving how the dialogue involving global warming was sort of corrupted uh, is, is quite fascinating and very dangerous and also symptomatic of processes which we find all the time happening. Uh, now I want to change the subject completely, I think, and I go to, uh, here we are, uh, yeah, and this, this is uh, something that I, I just read about also, and it's, I found this kind of uh, uh, curious in a way, that's a, a this is a Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and they did a, a big study about what it means to learn as a, a new skill. And in in uh, the <clears throat> the sort of uh, abstract in the beginning, that there's. We'll talk about the piano and how you, in the, when you, you, you take and you just play your scales back and forth. You just keep repeating the scales. That's sort of learning to play the piano. Now, uh, and they said, and they thought they said that no, but there is a smarter way to practice. Uh, this is so interesting. And what they said, they, what we found is if you practice a slightly modified version of a task you want to master, you actually learn more and faster than if you just keep practicing the exact same thing multiple times in a row. Um, okay, then they said this has implications not only for leisure skills, like learning to play a musical instrument, leisure skills, or sport, but also for helping patients and doing uh, medical procedures, which, which of course are, are very, very important. Uh, but this is, they said, our results are important because little was known before about how reconsolidation works in relation to motor skill development. This shows how simple manipulations during training can lead to more rapid and larger motor skill gains because of reconsolidation. Uh, now, what is reconsolidation? They have all this uh, goes on and goes on, but I can, I can uh, just uh, explain. Reconsolidation is sort of going back to the task and actually varying it a little bit. Let's say. Uh, so that that task becomes part of something maybe perhaps larger, whatever. And I thought, hmm, instead of doing this big study, they could have just called me up. 
or probably just spoken to basically any musician about how we actually practice and how we should practice. And this is what, this is what I'm uh, going to be devoting most of the time today to. Because when we, for practicing musical instrument, and that's of course what we are here in this live stream concerned about, uh, we have two possibilities and I, that I always say, and that is we can either practice in what we say is a smart way or we can just sort of hit our heads against the wall and hope for the best. And uh, of course, uh, it's a point that I'm always making is that our bodies do not distinguish in a certain way between what is right and what is wrong. What is good and what is not good. Okay? It's just what is repeated is reinforced. And uh, we know that ever since uh, uh, Pavlo, uh, the, the Russian psych psychologist, I guess you would call him, yeah, uh, did his famous experiments with dogs. And of course, B.F. Skinner, who was uh, a very prominent uh, psychologist in the United States, and they have this sort of stimulus response uh, theory where, of course, the, as you do something, you, as you repeat it, this, the stimulus becomes uh, more encoded and the response becomes more automatic. But, of course, that can lead to, if you practice your mistake, that mistake simply gets better and better and it becomes more and more difficult to correct it. And that's why when we practice as musicians, first of all, it's most important, and what we try to do, of course, is not practice our mistakes. So in other words, not simply repeat what we're doing in, in, and hopefully that, that repet, repetition will do something, no. But first, we analyze we find what it is, we practice, and then we practice around it. And that's exactly what they're saying here. Uh, this, in a way, reminded me of a study done at Carnegie Mellon. I believe it was Carnegie Mellon uh, University. This was uh, several years ago, which I read about in the New York Times. And that was another curious study, which says... Uh, was mentioned how what is the difference right, between as the study mentioned with a world class musicians and simply good musicians uh, and they did all this research etc etc and found that it was total hours practiced throughout the lifetime. It's another thing <laughs> that I thought when I read that, I said, wow, instead of spending all that money on this study, maybe you could have, you know, d d done a better job and given scholarships to students, and you could have just called me up. And, and probably not only me, because that's, I think, uh, that's something which is perhaps unbelievably obvious. Uh, and I know from my own self that when I look back, I've practiced a lot. And not only uh, pieces, but details I've practiced. And I've practiced also with an instrument and without an instrument, uh, while doing other things as well, I've actually been practicing. And that's, I'm going to explain that, uh, especially in terms of uh, 
embouchure, but not only fingers as well in, in the clarinet. Now, uh, what do I want to do now when I'm speaking about practicing and smart practicing? Okay, so I think I will take again, uh, let me put this away. I'll put this over here, I think. Take it far out here. And I have been talking about this in terms of a uh, form of hands. But I will speak now very specifically about practicing. And I take now this wonderful piece, little work of Donald Martino. Martino, uh, it's very possible that uh, several of you may not know that name anymore, although he is and was a very, can you, can you, no, is and was a very important composer. And his set for clarinet, which he wrote when he was just uh, right out of school, this is a, uh, here we go, I'm, I'm going to, She wrote in 1954, in fact. I thought it was 53, but it's actually 54. Uh, it's a long time ago. Is This piece is a, a, it's a, a classic for the clarinet, and it's a stepping stone. There are pieces for the, in the clarinet which, where, when you play them, when you master them, you actually reach another level of technique. Uh, and of course, the work which we t discussed in, in great detail earlier in the Nielsen Concerto is, is one of those as well. Uh, I would venture to say that also this uh, John Corleano's Concerto is another one of them. There's lots of, lots of uh, pieces that you can put in this category, uh, but this is definitely one of them. And uh, it's nice that that uh, this very kind of student composition of Donald Martino uh, is still in our repertoire and still uh, an important part of our repertoire. Now, the question is, I, uh, how do we go about practicing it? And, you know, I want to stand up, I think. It's much better. It's, I, can, I do much better that way. I'm, I'm not a person who likes to sit down. Uh, okay, and I use the music just so I can uh, tell people. Okay, here. So this is the, the opening of it, and we have this very... Do you, can you see it? Yeah? This, this initial patch, and then we have other things here. This, okay, so What do we need to do when, in order to uh, actually master this? And uh, is we if we find the certain details, certain uh, combinations of 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 notes, which are difficult, and it's never that an entire passage is actually hard, but there's always a place which is difficult. 
actually I think I wanted to start with something else <laughs> This is, I wanted to start with Copland, the Copland Concerto, which we never think of as, as, a, as a piece, although the original version is incredibly virtuosic in spots. Uh, we never think of that as the kind of stepping stone, but there are certain places and the, which are actually uh, difficult. And I think this, this will illustrate my point in, in a very uh, simple and clear way. So at, toward the end of the cadenza, I, I do this here and and actually let me get I, I get everything out so I can I show to people what exactly what I'm talking about I think that makes the most sense okay Today is really disorganized. I apologize. Let me see this should be here though. Okay. Yeah, I think I have it. Just this passage here. This is what I, I wanted to. I was going to play, but I should show it to people. It's just down here, right here. Okay. This one. We go up it, and and these. And I I think I will later, if we have time, I will I will talk a little more about this cadenza and about uh, articulation. Let me let me put this back. Okay, so why am I I'm why am I actually showing this? Because after after this, then here we have something that's a little bit difficult because. Going to the A, and then back to the C sharp, and you. At this moment, you have a good read. Probably it works okay. If, if, if all of a sudden something's not right with your read, uh, maybe you have trouble. But if we lo we look at this carefully, we see that what is not so easy is to do this, that, but to do this is actually not so difficult. So the important thing is to break, in fact, and you, you regroup things in a way that we eliminate the difficult connection. This is perhaps partly psychological, but so in other words, what uh, I would do to practice this if I needed to. And I break it up that way. You see, because in any case, that actually it works well in the fingers. Here. You see, and then as I, I practice, I take that space there yeah. and make it smaller until finally it's something like that so 
In other words, I would play. Uh, means since I, I have that kind of grouping let's say all of a sudden I'm playing and my read I'm sorry to uh, for people who are not clarinet players but this is in a way applicable to all instruments you know we have we all have our problems and this simply just happens to be a clarinet problem uh, ooh, and my read is totally on wrong always I'm doing something like that. This, this is the pandemic problem. Okay, so let's say I'm going along and I'm playing and uh, all of a sudden I'm playing and then my read, I've going, oh no, I'm not sure about this A, uh oh, as I'm playing. And of course, this is something that we should probably not do. It's while we're playing, sort of be out of what we call the zone, which is the moment of playing and sort of thing. I don't know what's going to happen there, but always we, we have these kinds of thoughts as we're playing. Uh, so l let's say, Yeah, this is happening to the read, and I'm going. Well, how, how? Where should I start? Let's say. I would do that. You see. So, in other words, I put the comma in. In any case. And that way, I am sure to play that A. While if I had the read was, was really bad. <laughs> Wait a second. I missed it. Okay. So the this sense of technically what goes with what is uh, most important when you are actually practicing something. So you, you, you group things in a way that, wor that wor work to make the technique uh, very stable, let's say. And what's very interesting to me about that is there's generally, in fact, I think there's always a kind of musical corollary to this. So, uh, what should I, I do before I go to, to, to uh, this Martino? Uh, yeah, let's, let's even, even uh, go to Weber. Very simple, uh, exa another simple example, I should say. And from the beginning there and we have then okay so we have a, a break between registers or between partials we can say So again, the way to practice to make this stable is we actually separate those parts. That way. And then uh, you take that space and you make it smaller. You see, and then you actually are able to sort of, sort of turn the corner and get into the fifth partial, as that, which is what that is, and play with great security. Now, one thing that I do 
or that I don't do, I should say, is I never play a very long passage, but I always will play shorter passages. Is that, we have a, no. <laughs> I play shorter passages and I connect them in ways which, will cr which create long passage. And we can do that with an, another scale, for instance, uh, which would be where, let's say in, in the first, <laughs> right, in, in the first concerto of Weber, um, I'm using all these because they are very, very standard, common, what's that? Is that something from outside, perhaps? Very, very common standard uh, passages, which I often, in, when I listen to people and when I'm teaching, I find that uh, people have trouble with them. So even here, there's a question of where the hand goes, you see. So those things when you have the E flat or if you play even this way you still have the sense that instead of the hands moving in one direction all of a sudden they move in a different direction so that's where we should change the group and then here we change the register and then with here again, E flat, we change the group. And there. So I break it into those parts and then I put them together. That way. And why do I say there's a musical uh, corollary to this? Because if you just play straight, uh, Somehow it's not so interesting, but if you need to have life, you need kind of variety. As we all said, variety is the spice of life. So, okay, I played, but and people go, yeah. That sounds great. And that's these groupings. Okay, with that uh, in mind, groupings, I go now to this Martino, at this initial gem, and I play slowly. Now, see, I can't play it slowly. <laughs> I can only play it fast. Okay. Okay, I can, I'll play that end of fast. Yeah, I know. I, I'm playing this piece for too many years since I was a very young teenager, so I can only play fast. Anyway, okay, so here. <laughs> Then we have that, and then all of a sudden we have this is the part right there. That's our problem. Not only my problem, but everybody's problem. And then the rest is actually not so difficult at all. So, how do we go about looking at this and actually figuring it out? We do it first by breaking it, so you have this way. And what's very important is that we feel this, I go back to the form, we feel the form of the hand, so that and then here too, we feel the form of the hand because we have to do this with the fingers. 
And if people remember, I had talked about the sense of rotation in the hand. So we emphasize this rotation so that is that. I'm sort of doing it too much, but that's uh, uh, really what I do. And also the shape of the hand, because if, again, if you remember, we have different positions and they have different hand shapes here, just like here too, we have different positions and they have different hands. We go into these positions, look at me, so you can see how it's not simply, oh God, I can't even do that, That's uh, uh, but it's the finger moving, but it's the hand moving around. Now I wonder, actually, I just came up with this thought now, that perhaps I really began to emphasize this sense of rotation because I have a very peculiarity that I'm very double jointed in my head. This way, you can see that in the thumb, this finger here is a little ridiculous this way. But what that means is that my fingers can get stuck easily. So I'm always looking to feel, or trying to feel, I should say, where the, how the positioning of the fingers, which makes them very strong. And uh, this is sort of like being a structural engineer in a way just a building uh, building or building a bridge for instance uh, you if you have a suspension bridge you have to actually calculate the angles of the suspension that will actually create the greatest stability and greatest strength here and very simply in the hand, so for instance, if I play this way, this is what happened to me just now, I actually lock in place and I can't play at all. So I'm always rotating, but this rotation uh, is not only for people like me who have these uh, sort of hyper uh, extensive uh, fingers, but for everybody because they enable you to play different uh, passages in a very, or, well, I never like to use the word organic, but I should use it, organic way, let's say. So here, so then, that way, and, uh, uh, so this is not working in the middle for me, but that way. Now we go on a little bit, let's say. And we have here an issue of dynamics in this piece. So we have and then we have piano. And then forte again. spaces in that so that our bodies can actually change the way we play so that we can play very clear and very uh, distinct uh, dynamics. So I would play in tempo for instance and put spaces in there. So that way and then again just like with the 
the scalar passages with the, what I did in, in Nielsen, and uh, not Nielsen, in Copeland, uh, I just make the spaces shorter. But in this case, I think to emphasize dynamic contrast, I keep a little space. So. <laughs> Basically, uh, this piece is, bi is built on what are called diminished or octatonic scales. So it's always kind of whole step, half step, and then sort of uh, thirds that are come out of that sort of combination. So to do that, is that way. And Again, you have to I group them in ways. So so the bum and piano. So again, I put the spaces in to practice and then also to keep a little space in order to maintain the contrast. And again, the passage where we need this hand. And I'm going to explain there. So, what we sh should practice always is these different hand positions that we have. And then what they do is they enable us to sort of chunk parts so that this is this way, this is this way, this is that way. Uh, I think I, earlier I, I explained in terms of very simple uh, see I'm sort of warming up so I'm getting better off better now but uh, uh, something like that where again it's just two positions that we have and if we have those positions there's no problem of, of playing at any tempo, at any, any whatever. That's in the straight, and then this way. There. So it's this way, that way, this way, that way. In case. And so going back to here. You say, so all of a sudden, I bring my hands this way, and I practice that motion. 
Now, I was talking about how the practice without the instrument. And so, it can be if I'm walking down the street that I actually practice that motion in a way. Okay. And uh, what I have to talk about now has to do with embouchure. And again, I talk in terms of this Martino piece. Uh, because we go all the way up to the high B flats and it goes up to a high B natural at one point uh, and from here that way and that you have to change considerably the embouchure and you have to change here so this involves a shift of partial, which I, I explained again very much earlier, and a shift on the on the mouthpiece and shift inside the mouth, da and that requires rhythm. Now, when I'm, I speak about the embouchure and I speak about the embouchure as an activity, as not uh, a state, not a thing but an actual way it's so that there's motion in the embouchure and the in the embouchure that we have there is also a rhythm there so this rhythm has is is something that we need to practice so that this rhythm be becomes uh, integrated into the entire performance, this rhythm inside the mouth. So we have rhythm in the fingers, we have rhythm, the, and then we have rhythm in the air. This way, that we have here. So uh, if I'm playing so I'm doing a e a e a e, and it's in the sort of tongue position, which actually controls the direction and speed of air. This a e, and then. with the tongue and the embouchure in general uh, is something that we have to do quite a lot of and we cannot practice this enough on the instrument so what we have to do is practice it when we are speaking for instance so when I'm speaking now, I'm actually feeling what is happening inside the mouth. I know. And you say, and I'm feeling the way things are moving. And that can be applied to when I'm playing. So basically, the embouchure even this way, embouchure, the lips as well. We're, I'm practicing, uh, I don't know, let's say, because I don't sleep that much. Let's say 16 hours a day, 17 hours a day, something like that. There's always even, and, uh, 
I think that I got this habit from my father because when I was a little baby and it's one of the first things I remember is he would always come to me and say, oh, make an embouchure. Mm -hmm. And I go, mm -hmm. <laughs> this way. And, you know, I'd be going, and then he would, he would look at me, oh, make an embouchure. Mm -hmm. I guess he had it in for me <laughs> from the very beginning. But I think that uh, sort of got me into the habit of, in fact, being concerned about that. Okay. Uh, then we also need to practice the fingers and once again it's something that we have to practice more than we can when we're actually practicing the instrument and that has to do, and what we need to practice there is a sense of form you see so when I for instance when I used to do this with with these rubber bands which I did earlier and the rubber band is very useful for this way even without the rubber band we can even without doing anything we can feel what the form is. So if I'm even doing this, I'm f in my, it's, it's, it's in my mind, but it's in my body, in the way that in my nervous system. It's, I, I forgot to put away, put this away. I'm sorry. I always turn off the phone and I forgot to do that today. Okay, so in, in my nervous system, I'm actually practicing this. And then also, let's say this, this initial passage in, in Martino, for instance, uh, or a later passage for uh, Martino, uh, I'm in my mind. I'm going over now not only the notes that I see but the fingerings so I'm actually practicing in any case what I'm, I'm going to play and I practice not only the fingering but the change position of hand just sort of going through in my mind which is actually in my whole nervous system, is that way. Uh, I don't know if I'm being clear at all, but that's... Uh, so, this... Uh, here, I, I wanted to show two things, though. And... Yeah, no, I know, I know, I know. First, but they, I think, in fact, they are... I thought perhaps they're not useful at all, but I think, in fact, they are useful. This is, I mean, per, the rubber band may be just as well, but this is something that working on. I should develop one that's a little less. But here, you can do this, and this way here. You see, so with that, you actually practice this stretch here and gain strength in our fingers this way, that way. And actually, this here, which is very curious, and I did, did do this at one, one point, but is I think very, very useful. And it is this. 
There you go. It's, it's sort of weird, but it's actually, I think of all the uh, sort of little gizmos to, to uh, work the mouth, I think this is actually the, the best, I think, because it's big enough so you can feel how the, the muscles will contract here while, and this is important, while instead of crushing the bone, this way. Uh, you actually work the muscles throughout, and there's a an, uh, the usual one is just has this going this way, but that only works in one direction, and I think it's that's not the best because in the clarinet world, uh, what we need are these muscles that are vertical here to actually form the embouchure as the mouth the jaw tends to stretch open. This is again the rubber band I was talking about for. Okay, uh, the question is what time it is now. Eleven twenty-two. Eleven twenty-two. I see. Okay, so I what I I think I I would like to do. Uh, is perhaps talk a little bit about articulation no, in the, the clarinet. Although I should also, I should maybe just talk more about practicing since I do. Because uh, the point of uh, that I feel very strongly about is is that we, when we practice, we should always put what we're practicing into a larger context. And this has very much to do with this Johns Hopkins study that I did. So even though, let's say I practice Martino, I practice other things as well. So that becomes a subset of what we're doing. And the idea behind this study in, in Johns Hopkins also has a lot to do with, for instance, <laughs> the fact that I missed the date. <laughs> and I originally reported <laughs> this live stream. This over here. I, I actually just wrote 19 instead of 20. And you wonder, well, what does this have to do with, with uh, practicing? And it's just that people are not very good at doing repetitive tasks. So if we just practice the same thing over and over again, we basically get bored and the pass and we uh, don't uh, um, actually uh, allow ourselves to, uh, to to play if we're musicians, let's say, in or to to learn the piece in a very thorough way, because we are not so good at just repeating. And this is and this is why in in the in the pandemic that we have now, uh, after a while we get tired of, and I get tired, and that's one of one of the reasons why probably I'm so scatterbrained at the moment. Uh, get tired of a particular situation, and we need we need this kind of variety. So when we practice, we also need this sort of variety. And uh, I uh, always mention that there are three types of pieces that we practice if we're, if we're playing. 
Uh, one of those, of these, are, is a the, it's the piece which we need to perform. Let's say soon. So we so that has to be very thoroughly practiced, and ideally we should memorize that the piece whether we're going to play it from memory or not. Then there's a second category where there's a, you have a piece where you practice up to a certain point, and then maybe you come back to it you know, this way. And then there's music which you just sight read. You just read. You come and read this music. So these three types. And these categories, you can have a, a, a piece here and a piece here and a piece here, and let's say the piece in the second category can be moved to the first category when you do. And the sight reading piece can be also moved to a different category. But you have this sort of larger uh, uh, view of what practicing is. And uh, certain days, perhaps, you just go through pieces uh, just to, to read through things. Now, actually, there's even a fourth category, which are pieces that you've known for a long time, and you play very well, but you go over them again. You know, and that's also important, because that sort of just reinforces what you already know, and then bits and pieces of what you already know can be applied to other things that you are you are actually working on, so this is uh, in in general what I think of of practicing as a way. Uh, now maybe I just talk about articulation a little bit, and then we I want to to. Uh, end with something. So, with uh, uh, perhaps a, a little surprise, we'll see. Maybe that would be good. So, articulation in the early days of the clarinet was something that was actually uh, written about quite a bit, and also was the subject of, of many different ways, I could say. So you didn't simply have tonguing and slurring, but you had different kinds of articulation, which actually had different uh, ways of executing this. And this, uh, so you had you had tonguing onto the reed. You had tonguing not onto the reed. You had uh, different syllables that people that people uh, wrote about. I should say talked about, of course, at the time, but we only know from writing. Uh, and you had tonguing with the, just the lip. And I, I mentioned that when I, I, I spoke about the period instruments a bit earlier, this. But I, I do this again, uh, really in regard to how you can use uh, different kinds of articulation on the clarinet. Okay, uh, in modern clarinet, I should say. But what is, I think, uh, common to all these kind, different kinds of articulation is one thing, and that has to do with the back of the tongue. And the back of the tongue, we, we don't think about it so much, but it's critical for playing. I mention always that the clarinet has a, a, a vocabulary of, of basically, with, it uses just one, excuse me, one vowel, this E kind of thing. And that's a simplification, but it's a, it's a, anyway an important concept to understand. And also that the tongue, just as we're speaking, let's say I say just, I'm actually manipulating the back of the tongue. 
and to a floating up and around forward, etc., etc. Uh, and we do the same thing, we should do the same thing when we are playing the clarinet and especially for articulation. Okay, now what does the back of the tongue do? The back of the tongue actually both creates breath support, as I've mentioned, with this kind of which will actually creates resistance, which is what breath support is. And it sort of turbocharges the air, so the air goes faster. Well, this is uh, like taking a hose with water and you squeeze it a bit and all of a sudden the water shoots out farther this way. And that's what the back of the tongue does in the air going into the clarinet. Now, why is that so important for articulation? And for that, we should think of string instruments. If you take a violin or any string instrument that's where you have a bow, articulation is most fundamentally the change of direction of the bow. Okay, you can have the sort of down bow or up bow. Now, even if you have that, rather than a smooth, uh, smooth motion, I should say, you actually have motion where you you are actually pulling or pushing faster at some point than the actual motion of the arm. That's what. Okay, and if you're changing, let's say, let's say you have this, if you're changing here, it's much more energy is required to go this way and back. The, the motion is smaller, but faster. This way. Now, when we are dealing with wind instruments, since we don't have a physical, uh, or I should say a visual, kind of, uh, uh, what, what should I say, Vi sort of visual reference, I would say, uh, to that can show us what to do. We don't think about it so much. But in fact, what you, what you need to do when you're tonguing is make sure that the air, just like if you're, you're, you're uh, going back and forth with a bow is fast enough. Right. So, it's rather than da 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 di 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 di, so that the air goes. So rather than di that way, and all kinds of tonguing requires that kind of air, sort of faster air that we have. So. So if I'm playing, well, even even I play, uh, it's all the yi that way. And by varying that, you can get different kinds of articulation. So uh, let's say we have a, a that so it's very this way, and I I have the image, but perhaps I'm doing kind of up bow spiccato on the clarinet. This way, and it's not going ta 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 ta. It's going that way, which gives very fast. Kind of, and and also short, fast and short burst of air. So, in fact, of course, and if you think about it, it's quite obvious that tonguing is not actually tonguing, but it's a way of moving the air. And the tongue can either help you out or get in the way. Uh, now, earlier in history, they were also tonguing with the lip, for instance, 
You see? And that's something that we can actually use. No, I don't see why not. Uh, and I, I, I do that sometimes, believe it or not. But still, it's the back of the tongue that works. I you mean tongue? What's that? No. That's sometimes bum. I'm not tonguing, but I'm bumming. <laughs> That's uh, that's uh, uh, D, and then uh, another thing that's possible with articulation is not to use even the lips or the tongue, but to cough. <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but uh, because this is something that. Anybody here, everybody who's watching this, don't tell anybody. <laughs> That's right, we have to mum's the word. But you can cough like this. And that can also be quite useful. And something I don't do so often now, but I do use it. And I don't use it because. Uh, I, I need to, let's say, it's a, otherwise I can't tongue. It's a, but I do it because I would like to have a variety of articulation. Now, if we again go back to string instruments, we have, we can say that the, the, the bow moves down or moves up. And string players try to minimize the difference, but there is a big difference, in fact, between the up bow and the down bow. And that difference can be used for principles of variety. Remember, we don't want to just do repetitive tasks, but we need variety, and also for expression. So this kind of <coughs> that I, I can do is something that, that you can, I can use to create a difference which is sort of like the difference between a down bow and an up bow. Now also it can be like let's say an up bow or down bow spiccato and it's something that you can but I can do something like that which I don't use my tongue with. Then of course there's double tonguing and, and that kind of stuff, and there are different kinds of double tonguing. And that's going to be another subject we have. So, uh, but this kind of using the uh that way, I think can be very useful as an expressive uh, tool. So uh, I go back to a little bit to this uh, uh, Copeland, let's say. So if I if I'm playing etc etc now uh, yeah, I should not do this kind of stuff, but you, you, you should get a little bit warmed up. But anyway, what I'm doing this this way, and why am I doing that? Because I could do. But doing this way. Gives more sense of da da wow da 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 wow. I think. What do you think? <laughs> and then even here. <laughs> and that's sort of sort of kind of like a dance move. That way. Uh, 
so and I think that's what I will talk about now but uh, do we have any time left no what time is it I'm busy. <laughs> You're busy. let me look <laughs> you see these these become more and more I say 1141 uh, for anybody who can stay if you have a little Or maybe I don't. We just stop there. And uh, there, but I, what I want to say is, uh, for, first of all, what I would like is uh, for anyone who is viewing here, all of you people, to give me suggestions, maybe pieces. Passages that you want explained, techniques you're you're interested in. Uh, I would like to now really do not to have uh, come with my own set of ideas and preconceptions, but actually to answer what your needs and desires are. So please uh, let me know, and I will actually. Uh, include them and in these these in these live streams which since our our pandemic is continuing and we have our second wave and third wave etc cetera, etc cetera, I will be continuing this and next week is uh this is for the United States we have the Thanksgiving holiday but I think that I will do a special little kind of live stream which will be a uh, performance of one. I will not uh, harangue you with political uh, issues and I will not talk about this and that and the other thing and I promise I will even choose a decent read. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> what do you think is who is this guy who's talking and playing in these terrible reads? Anyway, uh, and uh, so that will be next week, and I will uh, mention mention uh, that in uh, writing in an introduction, give you uh, perhaps a, a a bit of a, a even a kind of program about what I'll do. It won't be very long, but I thought this Thanksgiving we should both uh, give thanks for music. And also uh, remember not only who we are, but who unfortunately we have lost and cannot be with us for Thanksgiving. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Take care, and please, please be well. <laughs>